Well, noon has officially arrived on this Thursday, the final day of April. It's April 30th, if you can believe that. A little overcast, muggy, and hazy, not unlike the climate down here this time of the year in South Florida as we are back on the turf following a rainstorm, almost a Noah's Ark-type rainstorm going back to Sunday's action. But it's all good. We're fast. We are firm. Jason Blue and Acacia Courtney alongside. Again, quite muggy outside Acacia, but it's all good with another 11 race card as we close down the month of April. Yeah, pretty crazy to think uh, that we are wrapping up the month of April, and I think it's a great time to say another thank you to everybody that's continued to watch and wager on Gulfstream Park throughout this past month. And I know, uh, speaking for both of us, that we've had a lot of interaction with new fans on Twitter, whether that's from, from other countries or maybe just people that are new to the sport of horse racing. So hopefully you've been enjoying yourself, and we got a lot more good stuff to bring you this week at Gulfstream. We definitely do and there is no shortage of racing to go around here over the next few days in fact back-to-back -back 11s on both Thursday and Friday tomorrow would obviously be traditionally the Kentucky Oaks day at Churchill Downs and Saturday we have a 12 race card which would normally be Kentucky Derby Day but I'll tell you here locally at Gulfstream that Saturday card big fields galore and three stakes all together yeah, absolutely great card hopefully you'll be tuning in and uh, it is fun this time of year to get a chance to see some of the horse is still stable down here in Florida to have some opportunities for those stakes races. So really looking forward to all of those. Definitely. And we're looking forward to the Rainbow Six this afternoon. And for good reason, we are talking money, money, and more money with that $850,000 guaranteed jackpot ticket and overall sequence that'll get underway in the sixth race this afternoon. There is a good bit of turf on the card. And as we say, the perfect type placemat to start the action, even after scratches we still go with a field of 10 two handfuls in this upcoming three-year-old 25 to 20 thousand dollar maiden claimer that starts your early pick five it does and i have a single but not in the first leg i do think that the uh, the number 11 cardiac kid on the drop in class is a logical favorite in here but i ended up going three deep and um i was actually really intrigued by elvis's joy so i'm kind of bummed he's out but i'm i'm three deep in here we have another two-year-old race this time for the phillies at a maiden claiming level in race number two so I'm spreading in there do not we had a scratch so that means that the also eligible inertia gets in for Juan Alvarado and Arendelle farm my single comes in the third race though with Monmouth Drive I just think on the drop the race two starts back I ride Ortiz I'm just going to kind of take that short price favorite and mm -hmm. use it as my uh, free bingo square if you will we have a uh, two deep there in race number four I do think that um, this is a relatively tricky race i think that the eight fias could actually be the controlling speed if you wanted to spread one more i'd use beach traffic but He's been a little bit unlucky getting to the winner's circle and then three deep in the fifth to wrap things up. Three, four, seven. I hope you get there, Acacia. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, looking at that sequence collectively, race one out through the fifth, it does appear that Mama Drive is hands down going to be the shortest price favorite, maybe on the entire card. And that horse does look close to unbeatable on paper. More on him in a few seconds. But let's talk about this upcoming first race that in a way, I kind of like the fact that we've already got horses that have raced on the turf and the turf measuring stick undoubtedly belongs to your horse the 11 cardiac kid but you look at a horse the second time starting Todd Pletcher called by Tapature in Lime Teeny. that horse is certainly eligible to improve and take a step forward uh, this afternoon and then you've got the other contingent of horses like the number six Tigers back and the five this is Sparta who I have first and third who are both uh, first-time turfers in the case of this is Sparta a debuter this afternoon for trainer Christoph Kamant kind of a rarity because Christoph is the listed owner 
of this Colt by Verrazano. And a Colt uh, by Verrazano, who I do like on the turf, and out of a mare who's a three-time turf winner, so certainly seems to be uh, in the right spot here and should have no problems going the mile and a 16th distance. Amisail Jaramillo aboard. Um, I think that this could potentially be the type of race where you might like to take a shot. I, I certainly uh, think that Tiger's back on the drop is going to be the right spot. I, I will be honest, he didn't really strike me as a turf horse in his first couple of races. But more than anything, I think that drop's going to be really key for him. And the same goes for Lime Teeny, as obviously both of these horses just special weight company bit over their heads. Definitely. Now, Lime Teeny is second out for Todd. I wound up picking the six Tigers back just because of his pedigree. Agree. The drop I like. He's a third time starting Dale Roman's horse, so maybe he just get some general improvement. And he's a ghost zapper, smart strike uh, colt this afternoon. The second dam, by the way, was Pure Clan, mm -hmm. who went six for ten on turf. She was a really, I mean, grade one caliber horse for the late Bob Holthus. So I was hoping the pedigree might kick in at a good price this afternoon for the six Tigers back. As I was saying to you during the open, though, I feel, and I missed the 11 here, Cardiac Kid, but he has, despite being winless and three starts on the turf and five altogether. He's he's run the best of any of these on the turf thus far. Well, the, the most... The biggest thing I liked about him, and to be fair, there are some horses in here who've had some pretty disappointing performances on the turf, though for tougher. So he, like a few of others in here, is taking a drop in class. And of course, you don't love to see a six-figure horse dropping in for 25, but they've given him several chances. So this looks like the right kind of move at this stage. Um, what I think is going to be the key is that he has some speed. Um, his three turf races as well have been about as tough as you could possibly find. He debuted in Saratoga behind Field Pass and Decorated Invader and then ran a good second in that Churchill race and last time out um, here a pretty stacked maiden special weight as well off of a big layoff. So the drop looks like it might help him as well. And the drop, maybe not a drop necessarily but as we turn the page and move on to the second, you would imagine there is a good dose of just a realistic and realism and maybe some pragmatism going on considering all these two-year-old Philly firsters debut for a $25,000 maiden claiming tag at four and a half furlongs. Mm -hmm. For the record, this is our third two-year-old maiden race of the season here of 2020 in South Florida. And kind of a neat little subplot to this race is the fact that we have got Arundel and Wesley Ward knocking heads yet mm -hmm. again where Wesley sends out the number three, Sunshine City. And then you've got the one-two Arundel punch of Darla and Inertia on the outside. Arundel is up 2 nothing at this point over Wesley Ward. Let's take a look at Darla's recent breeze here just a few mornings back on April 19th. She was third on the outside and uh, this looked like a very workmanlike uh, breeze for her out of the starting gate where she's outfooted by her two, her two workmates. Workmanlike is a nice phrase for it. We'll put it that way. Um, th this is the kind of breeze that, yes, of course, you have to be a bit realistic. She she not only um, had a hard time out of the gate, but she had a hard time keeping up past this. And clearly her stable mate um, on the front there seemed to be the quickest early on. So I, I think this will be kind of, and there's Darla in the white cap on the outside. I think this will be a good litmus test for her. Sure. Um, I had her fourth. When Inertia dro drew in, I did elevate her a little bit as um, I'm wondering if Darla is just going to kind of be one of those grinding distance type based on the pedigree on the bottom side. She likely will will want to go a little bit longer. So so that's kind of the key. But this is another reason why those workouts from XBTV are such a valuable resource. And as far as Sunshine Cities did go, I got a chance to watch her um, turf work at Palmetto's two starts back. And she's uh, she's maybe a lighter frame kind of looking type than you would ordinarily see one of those strong, powerful sprint build uh, horses from uh, Wesley Ward's barn, a Ken and, Ramsey, Ken and Sarah Ramsey homebred that's uh, actually by a creative cause and not a kitten's mm -hmm. joy in here. But there is still some turf pedigree in here. And, and I did think that she might be grass, but she really wasn't, wasn't bad uh, outworking her mate. Absolutely not. She's obviously going to be favored. She's a big favorite in the early mm -hmm. double wagering. You've got some interest in the two missing link who debuts for E5 Racing and David Fox with Tyler Riding, uh, daughter of Cantharos, good trainer here. And I like the stat that you pulled here with trainer David Fox. This is what kind of pushed her over the edge. And on the bottom side, her pedigree is turf as well. But this was, I thought, a, a spot where Dave might be kind of overlooked with the presence of Arendelle Horses and, and Wesley Ward. And here 
is very good with two-year-olds debuting in maiden claiming for 26% win, 51% of the time in the money. And it's a big ROI. And I don't think that she'll be, you know, a giant price in this spot, but um, she has a couple of nice workouts over the main track here at Gulfstream. She's by Cantharos, who is versatile, and the mare's a kitten's joy, whose only win was on the turf, but she also won at two, so the mare was precocious, so we'll see what we get from this one. Always like with these races, special weight or maiden claiming, just seeing some of the new stallions. In this case, we have Social Inclusion, who's a real part of the main storyline going, and this will be his first starter at stud. He had a world of ability, wasn't my my horse didn't agree at the time the way he was campaigned and he retired actually a horse who maybe next to California Chrome or certainly was a top five talent in the three-year-old class of 2014 yet retired having never won a stakes race that being said I could see him being a very solid early season off the bat type sire because he was so fast and I'm wondering just with the one special inclusion given the pedigree the connections if this horse is just going to fly as soon as they open up the starting gate could be could be I don't love the inside post debuting for a two-year-old it is just four and a half furlongs and obviously at this stage of the game having speed is going to be really really key so if we see this one with a missile help up just kind of fly out of the starting gate that could be key as sure. well um, the the dam her uh Two wins were on the turf. She was over two at the age of two, and she's been a decent producer. Three out of her five foals have won. None of them won at the age of two. So I'll be curious to see if social inclusion does kind of help uh, provide some of that precocity and speed um, as far as his. And like you said, it is always fun getting to see these stallions at this stage. Absolutely. A year ago, it was Kozan who right yep. off the bat just seemed to get one winner after another. Let's move on to the third, and hopefully we've got a winner cooking here, and I think almost a universal winner when you look at the presence and mainly that last dirt effort it's two back for the six mom at drive he runs anywhere close to that I mean he will eviscerate this field and that was for a bit tougher against the 12-5 non-winners of two beaten a half length yes it's a drop but as uh, John Kimmel said to me the other day hey we don't have a lot of options as to where to run sure. so you just put them where you think they can be successful they're ready to race and this one goes back to what seems to be his best, best surface, and uh, we'll see if I read Ortiz just keeps on finding the winner's circle. Let's move on to the fourth, everybody. We're back on the turf, getting on to this three and up sixteen to $14,000 made in claiming race, and kind of off the bat, an interesting spot and in a, in a atypical spot, uh, not seeing a Hall of Famer Shug McGahee in $16,000 made in claiming races all that often. Uh, I'm just hoping in the two, in the form of the number two cloud base, where this horse coming back from Tampa, beaten by a nine to five shot who wired the field back on April mm -hmm. the 11th, just was hoping second time back as a three-year-old or second start as a three-year-old and only his second race since mid-July of 2019, you might just get some improvement and a step forward for the number two cloud base. You certainly could, and, and I didn't really know what to do with this gelding, to be quite honest with you, and Shook's actually been doing well at Tampa. I think he had a winning double yesterday, um, and this one uh, added the blinkers off the layoff, and it's just a, a drop right, right away, so I, I do wonder, but it certainly could just be a case of, hey, he's dropping in for the lowest he's ever run. Maybe he'll just kind of lay yep. over the rest of the field. So I absolutely agree with you, and this is the kind of race that I I, uh, I had some trouble with, I'll be honest. And I ended up going with the type of horse that I normally do not like to take, and that is a horse that is 0 for 16. But I feel like Fayez, unless one of the clash droppers in here or something happens with winning factor bias tactically could be at an advantage in here he's best when he's able to be forwardly placed i think edgar zayas suits him well i'm hoping he shows some speed in here and this is just going to be the right kind of spot and he'll be a nice price he will be a nice price on that quick turnaround. He ran here just mm -hmm. last Saturday behind Mr. Tito's, who won that blanket of photo there yep. over uh, Viking Plunder. We'll see how Fias does for Antonio. Winning factor has probably consistently run the best races on the turf, yet he has had a penchant for just being there but not sealing the deal, mm -hmm. obviously, and settling for narrowly beaten minor awards. That's a little bit of a concern, and I felt as though, in addition to him, the number four, Farmstrong, who's Achilles here is his running style. I mean, he likes to close from GPW. I felt for 16000 this would probably just be a good level for him. Yeah, I've been trying to get him home the last couple, so I jumped off today, so this is probably going to be the day that he won 
wrong because I loved him at 13 to 1 two starts back, and he just was left with too much to do late. So we'll see if he can maybe get in the fray a little bit earlier. As he gets uh, gets Tyler Gaffleyone mm -hmm. up in the irons, uh, subbing for Luca Panici, who we're wishing a speedy recovery to. Here's the fifth. We're back on the main. We'll cash out this early pick five, and maybe with the presence of Mama Drive, is it a pick four of sorts? We'll see. We've got a couple of new claims in this three and up Philly and Mare, a three lifetime $16,000 claimer, a horse like the two charge account, uh, who was claimed off Joe Orsito by Kendall Connie. Uh, uh, Kendall Condi, that is, about four months ago. Your top pick, the number three, Ms. Chaplin, who's got some speed. And I like the changes with my top pick. I respect both claims, obviously, but I like the variables that are switching up here with the four Bimini, mainly the drop in class and just a little bit less distance for this Philly by Brethren this afternoon. I think that the seven furlongs is going to suit her well, and I think she needed a drop, but wow, it's a big drop. She goes all the way down from the 62,000, even trying State Bread Steaks Company at Tampa back in December, and it's not even like um, like an allowance optional claiming race. She goes straight into the 16 non-winners of three, almost a little bit of a for sale sign out a little bit. So these are the kind of drops that I just take a little bit of a step back and that doesn't mean that she can't win she absolutely could just run away from the rest of the field in here and i realize that trying to make it three in a row for miss chaplin and and uh here for new connections is a big ask but i love to see louisa staying off the claim and i like that she has speed all right as we take a little time out we'll speed right into that first break back with a good start to the rainbow six after this And we roll into the second segment of this live Thursday edition, our April getaway edition, if you will, of, of Gulfstream Park today. We've got the mighty Pegasus. Uh, you've got to just love Pegasus out there uh, watching over us and high above the finish line here as we gaze out upon Howendale Beach. Things have obviously settled quite nicely out there following another busy morning with uh, trading hours here at Gulfstream Park. That wrapped up at about 10 a.m. and we're set to go beneath the bright lights of our respective studios. Jason upstairs, Acacia downstairs, and we've got good reason Acacia to be pumped up, not only because of the big Rainbow Six guarantee, but with the new week comes another Friday, the first Friday in May, and you're in the pressure cooker. I am. Hopefully May will be uh, a good start to the month. Let's put it that way. Uh, um, just to clear up some confusion, I did get a few messages on Twitter. Unfortunately, it seems like a lot of people end up beating the expert every Friday. So if you beat the expert, you are then entered for a chance to win one of the beat the expert polos and three are chosen each week. So keep on playing. We really appreciate your support and, and joining in. It's free to play. You can go to our Facebook page or the Gulfstream Park website. Let us know you're playing. It's always a lot of fun, even if we're cheering home those short price favorites than getting beat on the wire. <laughs> What's doing with the Rainbow Six this afternoon and wishing you good vibes good and good luck <laughs> in the Beat the Expert contest tomorrow afternoon with an 11 race Friday. But as far as the Rainbow Six, what's cooking this afternoon? Stepped it up a little bit today for 5760 as we have 850,000. It seems, Jason, like this is this pool has grown really, really quickly. And Wildfire. Has been, yeah, yep. it's been really well supported each day. So make sure you get a stab because um, these six out of sixes even have been paying really nicely too. So I spread with four deep in a really nice way to kick things off. Um, we have a nice little rematch with Fuddle and Gloriously, a couple of interesting horses in that maiden race. I've got Bee Encounter and Augusta Moon, another rematch. Those look to be the logical ones in the seventh. I'm three deep in the sixth race. You've got a couple of horses 
those who have been kind of knocking on the door towards the outside. We'll see if this might be the place for them. My long shot comes in the ninth today, and I really like her at a big price. Admiral's win on the drop in class, who's uh, going to be running late. Nice. So I'll see if I can get that one home. Too deep in the 10th, a uh, lot of rematching again there, and then we wrap things up. Um, I think Bacano could be a live one in there. I believe you like that horse yep, as I'm well. Yep, I'm with you. And, um, and I thought creative genius to the outside getting back on the turf. All right, so you're inside and out, bookend, uh, bookend uh I guess two or spread. It's a bookend <laughs> two or spread yeah. to wrap things up. One and 12 inside, outside, and vice versa. As we do begin, I think this is a real high watermark on today's card. I like this. Nice I like this opening maiden special weight race for the Phillies and Bears quite a bit. A uh, number of different layers to this field. And I think a big part of the narrative is the fact that you've got that key rematch uh, between Fuddled and Gloriously, who are both coming out of a race here on March 27th. And I think if you're a fan of of either of these fillies this afternoon uh, where Gloriously was in the Strata colors vying in between with that big white blaze and fuddled first out. I mean, ran like a pro. She won't win this race, but did everything right. Pocketed up, angled smoothly, and she'll come with that five wide finish, easily be defeating Gloriously for mm -hmm. second. I think both these horses are, are very liable to run very well this afternoon. In fact, I went right back to fuddled, liked everything I saw with her first start. Yeah, she was very professional. She was beaten by an even money favorite. And uh, and while Safi does have a lot of good numbers, first time out is not one of his is high percentage mm. move. So the fact that she now has a race under her belt, I absolutely have to imagine she's going to move forward with that nice Irish pedigree. She was purchased for about 360000 at uh, the Tattersall's October sale as a yearling. So she's certainly bred to be a nice one. So I'm looking forward to seeing her second time out. I agree with you. I thought Gloriously was well beaten that day, but she could move forward. But I kind of wanted a new face in second. I agree with you. I think Fuddle's the one to beat. And we haven't seen Humor Me Dixie since her debut at Ellis Park, where she ran behind Upscond. Um, but Mark Cassie, I thought an interesting stat here. Turf sprints with maiden special weight runners after a greater than 180-day layoff. He has some really good numbers for this year, and he's got a Rad Ortiz up 24% win, positive ROI of 243. No, it's a good number for the barn, who, again, I one of the things I love about Mark Cassie, not just his success, but the fact that that is an operation that I don't think is really caught up in terms of just percentage and gotta gotta be at 30 or 25 percent. Mark not afraid to run his horses, mm -hmm. so at times maybe you'll see some stats that are a little on the lean side, but that's clearly a a, a strong suit of theirs. And uh, you bring up some good points with the eight humor me Dixie, who above all you mentioned abscond. She went on to do some good yeah, things last season at a very high level for Eddie Keneally. Yeah, she did. She ran in the Breeders' Cup. She was really Really successful in uh, in tough company and graded company up in Canada as well. We saw her come back here uh, to Gulfstream, and maybe she didn't quite uh, run maybe as well as she did as a two-year-old, but she's a very talented filly for sure. And we've got Jimmy Toner in the mix. Mm -hmm. Speaking of one high-quality, high-class veteran trainer like Mark Cassie, uh, perfect the dovetail on a Jimmy Toner who's got maybe the speed of the speed here in the three coin, mm -hmm. the phrase? Yeah, she certainly could be. I mean, her last two races have been really tough beats. And uh, and she's owned by good friends of mine. Full disclosure, but uh, I like uh, I like the speed for sure. I thought the race last time out, Notorious RBG was as game as could be, and reluctant. Bride came flying two starts back. And those were some tough maidens at the time she was running against. Got to go Mo has since come out of the race. That coined the phrase is exiting. She's the lone next out winner, but good competition for sure and good company of late for coin the phrase. Let's move on to the seventh here. We'll start the late pick five. We do so with a probably heavy favorite in the form of the one bean counter who lost a tough one with a perfect ride and good trip. We're going to check out in a few seconds. I'm just going to, from her inside post and with that good speed and just her sharp overall form. I'm going to single her as a big favorite to start. She won't be as short as Mama Drive, I don't think, back in the third race this afternoon in the early pick five, but I think she's going to be tough. I've got coverage the remainder of the way, and I used your one and 12, the two bookend, two mm -hmm. horse spread, and I added the number three in the 11th race this afternoon. A uh, couple of uh, posts off the rail. That's the number three in the mix. Is that Bodie Cody in the nightcap? Indeed it is. That horse is four. 
form has been pretty good. Getting back to Bean Counter, though, she's got a, a rematch and a little bit of a turf showdown uh, alongside the Patrick B. and Cone train, I Am Magical. They had knocked heads back on March 29th. Now, I Am Magical, I forgot how early she had moved up in this race without cover. She's widest of all in the brown cap, and then obviously you've got the orange cap of Bean Counter, who pulled the pocket, angled out, and it looks, I mean, at this point, Acacia, it looks like she's got Big Tina dead to rights, yet Big Tina just would not let her by in a very gritty effort. Yeah, she did. She ran a huge race, Big Tina, and I will say Bean Counter was very game. However, when it's an even money shot trying to run down a 16 to 1 shot, you would have liked to see her get there. Right. But that said, sure. I mean, look, she's she's been very consistent in her recent races. I think that she's absolutely a, a, a worthy one in here. I took Augusta Moon just because I thought that she could be maybe a little bit more of a stalker type of uh, finisher. And, and I, I did kind of prefer that just tactically as I feel like Omnia has some more speed um, than we even saw last time. I am magical has the ability to be forwardly placed and maybe Chicago um, has some speed as well. So I was hoping Augusta Moon might just sit a trip, but I really respect being counter too. Definitely. And your top pick has come to hand in a big way for Rohan mm -hmm. Crichton. She's a major player next to Bean Counter, probably easily has the best, sharpest recent form. Let's move on to the eighth. We're back on the main. We bring on some very tricky race, a three-year-old yes. fifty dollars to $40,000 claimers, where I went to, I guess, more logical-looking horses, but this could be a good fool around race uh, you and I in fact essentially using or boxing up three of the same four in our respective uh, supers there and I gave the top vote to the seven chill haze just the fact that he has not run a poor race in his last couple between February and April and just lost a tough one last time out. Although there might be some new shooters in this race. I'm still on the fence, if I'm being honest. Maybe a little ambivalent to that April 11 feel when he was turned back by a $80 winner and he's a babe. Yeah, that's fair. That was one thing I had a little bit of a question of as well. But I agree. I mean, you, you really can't knock his last couple of races. And when he turned back sprinting last time, he really did delivered he ran very well to be beaten just a neck um bourbon street is a, a similar looking type he was sure. claimed um and one thing that i thought was really interesting with him and i don't know if you remember this is that his first couple of races he'd been really really unprofessional and keyed up and he was gelded at the end of february and he's taken a big step forward since so i'm just hoping that he's continued to gain some more momentum some more maturity and that we're going to see one of his stronger races now and and Mark Cassie has the nine speedy hands. Hans Gruber in the mix this mm -hmm. afternoon. I don't know if you've ever seen Die Hard, but that's what that reminds me of. Gelding by Constitution, who's a rare second off the clay move yeah. for this barn, right? Yeah, I mean, it's quite crazy. You look and you see Mark Cassie and Gary Barber claiming a horse, which is not really something you see a lot of at all. Parked outside trying the turf last time, and I think took money because people just weren't really sure right. what to do with it. Right. Um, so it looks like he's back at his preferred surface. And as far as moving back, you've got another entry box at the same time in tandem between as we get on to race number nine and we're on the turf for these Florida bred allowance optional claiming Phillies and Mares, but an in tandem rematch again. Number of showdowns or turf showdowns today on the card, mainly between the one Ghostly Beauty and uh, the number eight Yolanda's Pride who are coming out of the same race and will backtrack to that performance back on April 4th. Now Yolanda's Pride was up close, tracked the pace, in fact, without cover, lost a sufficient amount of ground at three wide Ghostly Beauty, meanwhile, who's right in that second flight in the white saddle towel for Mike Maker. This was a race, ultimately, I walked away from thinking she should have she should have won, mm -hmm. and she just just seemed to me she lacked serious punch and deep stretch as she, she can't keep up with the winner, the number one Lady Panda. And it's too bad. I, I feel like I've kind of felt that about Ghostly Beauty's mm -hmm. last three races yep, or yep. so. I mean, you just feel like she just should have gotten there given everything that's behind her and everything she has going for her. I think that she will be a shorter price, but I mean, her last few races have kind of been tough beats at uh, at the this distance on the turf. And I agree with you. Out of that race, I preferred Yolanda's Pride. Um, here's my long shot, my kind of goofy long shot pick in here. But I'm hoping that we are going to get a chance to see Admiral's win 
in maybe just kind of uh, upset things or at least hit the board at what will, will likely be, I think, a pretty generous price. I mean, she ran behind Barika and Starship Jubilee in her last two. So no, this is definitely, a, I think, a, a softer spot. There should be a nice pace. And she's actually run well at a comparable or even slightly tougher level before. Well, you know, nobody has had the amount of luck and success backing these Santa Cruz ranch yeah. homebred <laughs> like Ronnie has. I Ronnie know. is always able, it seems, to <laughs> suss out which one of these Juan Rizzo horses may step <laughs> up and run big at a big price. I hope maybe you're on to something here. The 11 Admirals win some good points by you. It's hard to argue with who she's been facing. I mean, she's really been ambitiously yeah. spotted. This is not an easy field for sure, but you're going to get paid. Uh, you got Yolanda's Pride, who I picked in the mix for trainer Steve Cosset. And again, there is consistency and, and quality with ghostly beauty, but there is kind of a, an alarming sameness with the kind of races she runs where right there just not being able to deliver that knockout punch. Yeah, that, that's what I think kind of makes her maybe a little bit more of a vulnerable favorite. And I think Yolanda's pride is tough. And I, uh, I like you, will be curious to see Sister O'Toole step up and face winners for the first time. I know her buyer speed figures don't really match up with the rest of the mm -hmm. field. She just broke her maiden. But I think that she's got some ability. So this will kind of be a nice litmus test for her. Absolutely. I feel she is absolutely one and she looks a little different than some of the more heavily raced mares in the race, mm -hmm. but I think she's heading this way for sure. Yeah. We have not seen her hit her ceiling yet, and that could be a real, real positive uh, coming back off the maiden win from Graham, for Grand Motion and Louis Saez. Last trip on the main track on this uh, April 30th goes in our featured 10th race, a second level 50K optional claimer going a mile and a uh, big scratch in this race. Safi is very active throughout the entire card, uh, but his absence, or at least the absence of the number one, I'll take the cake, who he trains, is going to be felt here. And with her out, and I liked her as the favorite, I scratch into probably the favorite now with no, I'll take the cake in the seven cuddle kitten, who's form all together on the dirt, just very solid as she goes off the claim for Happy Alter. She has been really solid. And, and I think with the scratch of I'll take the cake, and I had picked Bella Chow all along thinking that there'd be a hot pace in here there still should be enough speed up front but I'll take the cake coming out does I think change a little bit the overall dynamic of mm -hmm. the race it it may not just be as as run and gun as it might have originally been um, and I'll take the cake could have been a bit versatile uh, but I still think that Bella Chow could just be in the right spot and she she I think is best when she gets to go the one turn mile she's a bit of a tricky horse in that she kind of is a mid-pack, almost. She, she's kind of not one of those late-running grinding closers. She's like a mid-pack grinding closer. Mm -hmm. So she kind of needs things to go her way. But I like to see her router at tease taking the call. And um, Antonio Sano has been on a nice little run lately, too. And this is a barn we know runs a lot, can get very hot and cold. Yeah. So when things start to click, uh, it's best to pay attention. I'm with you with the five, Bella Chow. I feel like she's got ability. She's a little little inconsistent, yeah. but her A game makes her absolutely a major, major player here, especially if you're not totally convinced about the seven cuddle kitten who was claimed nearly 80 days ago. I do like the fact, though, and I think it needs to be stated, she has, even looking at her 13 races on display here, she's run okay for different barns, not just the uh, operation that had her last time mm -hmm. out. You're going to go 5-2, I'm going to go 7-5, and we'll wrap things up. I know we're one twelve here in the uh, nightcap, and 12-1 with a 12-5 two-lifetime claimer on the grass. A Bacano for the, uh, from the rail for me. Uh, second off the claim for a good barn with Edgar Zayas. I respect the three Bodie Cody, and you're all the way outside <laughs> with Mr. Trader David Fox. I had, I actually, I don't know about you, Jason, I kind of stared at this race for a while. Um, I, I ended up with, I, which I found funny too, the top two horses I have are both 10 to 1 on the morning line, but I felt like Creative Genius hasn't really had a chance to run on the turf that much and has never run this low, so I'll give this one a shot. And I felt Bacano second off the claim, dropping in class, looked like in a good spot. All right, for an operation that will be running Trophy Chaser in a couple of days, right, at Oaklawn Park. Yeah, and King Guillermo in the right. Arkansas Derby in one of those divisions. No doubt. Yeah. You know, things have really quick uh, click, that is, for Trader J.C. Avila, right? Yes, that's right. Avila. Avila. And we've got the one and only Pete Aiello coming <laughs> up next. That. Pete's got those Thursday scratches and changes. We'll have Ronnie off site. And glad you're with us, everybody. Acacia and I joining you shortly before the first.